Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Millian. I'm the president of the Private Motor Truck Council of Canada. I want to thank you for registering for today's webinar and taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Uh, it is 11 o'clock, so we're going to get started right on time. We, we had roughly 90 people register for today's presentation, so I'm sure we'll have some joining late, um, but that's okay. Um, so the, just to go through a few um, logistics of how the webinar works, um, only co-hosts have the ability to mute, unmute themselves and turn on their camera. A participant, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, your questions or comments will only go to myself or one of the co-hosts, um, and we will ask those questions on your behalf at the end of today's presentation. Um, I want to thank our sponsors who have made this free for you to attend today, uh, Enbridge uh, and West Hill Innovations. Thanks to your generous sponsorship and support, uh, today's webinar is free to attend uh, for the people who registered and signed up for it. So thank you for our sponsors. I also want to thank you for our four panelists that you will see their names up on the screen right now. And I will introduce them when we get to their presentations. Uh, what's going to happen today is after we're through the, the introductory remarks and the uh, sponsorship videos that we have here for you today, uh, we have each one of our panelists will do a five minute presentation on the alternative energy technology that they specialize in uh, and the expertise of their company that's associated with it. Uh, so I will introduce our panelists at that time. We will have four or five minute presentations. Once they are done, I will bring all four of them on the screen and we will have a roughly 15 to 20 minute panel that I will moderate. And at roughly 10 to 12, we will stop and provide 10 minutes for questions and answers uh, that come in from the audience. So any questions that you have, put them in the chat, like I said, and we will ask those questions at the conclusion uh, of today's presentations. Without any further ado, I wanna get right into the the topics. Uh, so we have, like I indicated, we have two sponsorship messages from our sponsors. Um, so I'm going to put myself on mute, turn my video off, and we'll play that first sponsorship message. And the first one is from West Hill Innovations.
Thanks to West Hill for that message and thank you for your generous sponsorship here today. Uh, next, I have one from Enbridge. This will take a moment, so please be patient. It's a YouTube link, so I'm gonna have to start it, pause it, and then I will have to change uh, my screen share uh, and enjoy this message from, from Enbridge. Ontario's first carbon negative bus made headlines when it launched in Hamilton, Ontario. Naturally, many people asked, what makes this bus's fuel carbon negative? By switching to renewable natural gas produced from organic waste, any vehicle can become carbon negative. The entire process, from diverting methane to displacing diesel emissions, can take total net emissions to below zero. Simply, when more carbon is removed than is emitted, that makes a vehicle's fuel carbon negative. People will always produce food scraps and animals will produce manure. Inevitably, both of these will emit methane, which is about 25 times more harmful than carbon dioxide. So what exactly makes this bus carbon negative? Let's take a closer look. Once organic waste is collected and processed, methane is captured and turned into RNG. The energy to produce RNG for this bus takes around 42,000 kilograms of carbon equivalent per year, but it also prevents about 770,000 kilograms of carbon equivalent from being released into the atmosphere. The RNG is then delivered to vehicle fueling stations. Even though an RNG vehicle releases tailpipe emissions, the cumulative impact is still carbon negative because it diverts over 720,000 kilograms of carbon equivalent every year. Let's compare this to a battery electric bus. While an electric vehicle doesn't emit tailpipe emissions, it's only as green as Ontario's electricity grid, even when sourced from a mix of renewables and non-renewables. Generating the electricity needed to deliver and charge the vehicle produces about 14,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year. Compared to an RNG vehicle, the impact is clear. Overall, fueling with RNG removes more carbon from the atmosphere, which is key to achieving Ontario's climate goals faster. To learn more about RNG, visit enbridgegas.com RNG. As conflict and tragedy... And hold on. There we go. Okay, and thanks again to Enbridge for that message and sponsorship, and thanks uh, as well to West Hill. Uh, our first presentation today is coming from Kelly Hawes, CEO, Cold Star Solutions Incorporated. Kelly has a varied background, including serving 10 years with the Canadian Armed Forces and 25 plus years of the transportation industry. In December of 99, after recognizing that a potential niche market for specialized refrigerated trucking existed on Vancouver Island, Kelly started Cold Star Freight Systems Incorporated. In a short period of time, Cold Star became a multi-million dollar company, which on July 1st of 2014, merged with a Victoria-based grocery wholesaler, Wilson Foods, 1994, to become Cold Star Solutions, Inc. They employ over 180 staff who work from six warehouse locations. A significant focus on Kelly's work is to work within the industry to create and implement food safety regulations for the transportation industry and continually challenging ourselves to be better regarding food security and reducing waste is constantly looking to improve our environmental practices. Kelly, welcome. Yeah, and thanks, Mike. Uh, glad to be here, obviously. And uh, I always love talking about our CNG program. Uh, so yeah, in a real nutshell, uh, um, we started. Uh, I started researching it in 2012 uh, and bought our first trucks in 2014. Sorry. And um, so we started off with 10 Mac um, day cab tractors um, with two 45 DGL tanks, like what you see in the picture here. Uh, so they're side mounted uh, on the rails. 
um, the, with the 11.9 liter Cummins engine. The reason we did that at the time is we tried to make sure that the trucks were as similar as our diesel trucks so that the drivers could have a direct comparison. Um, so we were running Mack trucks at the time. So uh, converting CNG or buying brand new Mack trucks with CNG um, gave them a, a direct correlation. The guys, um, it took a little bit for the guys to adopt the technology and get comfortable with the trucks. Um, but um, it took them, you know, a week or two. Um, and now uh, eight years later, um, the guys won't drive anything else. Um, so uh, We've uh, we found the program very successful. We've had our hiccups because we're as an early adopter um, for sure, uh, but we've worked through those um, and continue to move forward. So I just go to the next slide there. And uh, so currently we've got 18 class eight tractors uh, with the ISX 11.9 uh, liter and seven five ton trucks, uh, like you see in the photo here. So the interesting thing with the with these trucks is uh, because everything we do is refrigerated. When we put the CNG tank on um, this truck, uh, obviously the reefer is still running on diesel. So you see, we had to put a diesel tank um, onto the box. The interesting part about that through this exercise um, is that uh, before the reefers would run off of the clear diesel that uh, coming out of the fuel tank for the engine. Now the reefer runs on Mark diesel, um, which is 15 cents a liter cheaper. Um, so we actually have converted any of our diesel trucks. We've put an additional uh, fuel tank on so that uh, we can separate uh, the fuel. We save the fuel saving or have the fuel savings on the reefer. Um, but more importantly, we can track the true mileage of the truck and the true operating uh, cost of the reefer. So. Yeah, so back in 2010, when, or sorry, 2012, when we were trying to understand this, there wasn't a lot of information um, and the trucks were pretty expensive um, and we had no fueling uh, uh, capability on Vancouver Island. So it took quite a bit. Um, I, I'm pleased to say that now at least there's a lot more information available um, and a much easier process to uh, determine whether or not CNG is the correct uh, uh, fuel and, and whether the program makes sense for your operation. Um, first off, uh, in BC, Fortis has been instrumental in helping us adapt uh, or adopt this technology um, because they provide uh, certain incentives. I believe right now um, they pay or you can apply for the incentive that covers 50% of the differential between the cost of a diesel truck versus a CNG truck, um, which goes a long way to, uh, to helping uh, make that decision. Um, and then, um, and the other part that's interesting is everybody talks about how challenging it is to um, have fueling stations. Um, that's becoming much easier to, um, to deal with uh, just by talking to your local uh, CNG dealer. Um, the other thing is the Cummins playbook uh, is crucial. They, they can talk about that for sure, but it's very helpful. Um, obviously we had no fueling stations, so we were able to do that, uh, work with Fortis, get a fueling station built on the island. We now have two on the island plus one in the lower mainland, so we're easily covering our, our range. Um, and, um, and so we get about 400 kilometers on our tractors, which is more than enough uh, uh, range for us. Um, yeah, reputable dist uh, distributor and servicing available on Vancouver Island. Basically, all the OEMs are now carrying this and uh, have the capability to, to work on it. Plus, we have our own shop that is uh, fully certified to do that. There's the guys there. Um, we put a just a shop like this so that we can work on the CNG trucks uh, without having to do a ton of uh, renovations and, and things like that. Uh, and we only have one truck in the shop at a time. So. Yeah, so uh, I'm excited to answer questions today. Um, and, uh, and by all means, you can go on our website. We have a whole page on uh, our CNG program as well. Yeah, so the results, obviously, 25% uh, savings maintenance costs are comparable. Drivers love the trucks that, um, you know, they're clean, they're quiet. 
Um, the big thing here is we've reduced the greenhouse gas emissions um, by a thousand tons uh, or equivalent to two, removing 220 cars. Uh, that's each year. The other thing here in uh, NBC is that we can sell our carbon credits. Um, so last year we used 32,000 gigajoules of natural gas, produced 407 credits, and we sold those credits uh, for $465. And within what happens is the BC government stamps your uh, carbon credits and certifies them. As soon as you have that, you can sell them on the open market. Um, and I sold them to a big, a big oil company and two weeks later had a check in my uh, bank account for $189,000. Um, which almost buys a CNG truck cash every year. Um, RNG is something we're really looking at right now and, um, and want to uh, move forward with that. And then you see what the carbon credits uh, would equate to using RNG. So $970,000 in sales of our carbon credits is more than our entire fuel bill for our company, um, you know, running 45 trucks. So um, yeah, so uh, that's my time. Thank you very much and look forward to the questions at the end. Thanks, Billy. Certainly some interesting numbers there and I'm sure the numbers have changed even in more of a positive direction with the fact that fuel has gone uh, through the roof uh, yeah, <laughs> lately. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so we'll see Kelly uh, in about 10 or 15 minutes here when we get to the end when we have panel questions. So. Next up, we have Naeem, and I hope I get this name right, Naeem. I should have asked you before. Naeem Farouki. Did I get it correct, Naeem? Yeah, yes, you did. Perfect. Uh, Naeem is the Global Technical Director of Woods Zero Emission Mobility Practice and has led the ZEM team in successfully delivering battery electric bus and municipal green fleet planning studies across Canada and globally. Naeem has extensive experience delivering green fleet plans and improving facility and fleet operations, and is highly experienced in managing large, medium, and small capital projects of various vehicle program needs. He provides a holistic business case assessment on potential cost savings and efficiency improvements for clients. Naeem, you should be able to uh, should be able to share your screen there. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me on this panel today. I'll be talking about decarbonizing transport and driving our zero emission future. At Wood, we work with organizations to help them understand their carbon footprint and how they can decarbonize their transport operations. So in terms of our firm, Wood is a global leader in consulting and engineering. Uh, we have about 40,000 employees operating in 60 countries with 400 offices. Our practice is broken up into three main services, consulting projects and operations. Myself, I work in the consulting energy transition space, helping fleets uh, understand governments uh, develop roadmaps for alternative fuel technologies, such as CNG, RNG, hydrogen, electric. And uh, we've worked with some very large fleets as well as uh, government uh, fleets on how we can decarbonize their operation. So an interesting fact about uh, transitioning to a lower carbon emission is that roughly 25% of the global GHG emissions comes from transport uh, and up at 25% uh, cars, trucks and buses account for nearly 75% of these emissions. And uh, when I talk to our uh, clients about this transition, it's really important that all technologies be viably looked at, uh, such as RNG, hydrogen and electric on this journey for heavy duty applications because uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all or silver bullet. Uh, what is driving fleet decarbonization? Uh, policy and funding commitments to start. Uh, many countries are using carrots and sticks to encourage adoption. Uh, as you know, uh, in 2035, the internal combustion engine is being banned in Canada. So we will have to look at alternative technologies and that's in the uh, personal vehicle space. But for heavy duty will follow suit. There's a lot of pressure to look at that. Social demands, consumers are asking for a more sustainable future. Uh, ESG goals and SDG goals are really changing uh, the consumer mindset and companies that have incorporated ESG into their supply chain are being rewarded with higher uh, uh, customer bases and better margins. 
as well the technology has evolved greatly so we've seen a lot of advancements in battery chemistries vehicle engineering and the hydrogen fuel cell leading to an overall cost uh, reduction and addressing range anxiety and climate resiliency and economics so as these gigawatt factories and more hydrogen is starting to be produced at scale we're seeing a, a drop in the cost of these technologies for implementation and that is making it viable for uh, decarbonizing fleets. So one of the things that I do with clients is it's a systems-based approach when you're talking about decarbonizing. Uh, there's five elements that uh, I like talking about. First is the facility itself. You will have facility modifications. And here at Wood, we use a triple bottom line approach to build out the facility costs. You might have to uh, change your uh, add some sensors, add ventilation if you're going to CNG. For electric, you'll have to look at height clearances on equipment and garage access. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, power coming to site is a big challenge. So understanding if you have a power deficit, do you have enough of uh, pressure in the gas line coming to the site for refueling purposes? So these are the questions that we uh, work through with our uh, clients to develop their transition plan. As well as understanding emissions, the Enbridge video that was played earlier gave a great example of understanding two uh, technologies and which one is actually more better for the environment. So we actually map tailpipe and upstream emissions to give you a holistic picture of the technology adoption playing out. Uh, next is the skills gap, the, the human element. There's a lot of training that needs to be done with alternative technologies in terms of maintenance, in terms of so as you're uh, playing out this adoption, it's important that uh, you know these be mapped. And in our transition plan, we do incorporate that element. And then lastly, the fleet specifications. How big should the tanks be for CNG and hydrogen? Uh, how big should the battery be? These are these are questions. What kind of configurations you should do? And there's uh, a lot of excitement around alternative fuel technology engines right now. I'm pretty sure Cummins will talk about their 15 liter, but that is the, the type of stuff that we're seeing, horsepower, power takeoff analysis. These are things that we do with the fleets to understand that if they have uh, more of a, a challenging terrain that they're operating in, that they have the right horsepower to complete the operation without a hiccup. So we take great pride in sort of answering those holistic questions and looking at that uh, approach. So uh, as I mentioned, the uh, zero emission SIM, what it does is instead of going and buying a truck and going through all that painful process, you can actually just simulate it in a virtual digital twin. So we have digital twins of different trucks and we can just operate and tell you, okay, will this truck behave for the operating cycle and what's the range? So, and then what we do is we actually test the variability or resiliency by increasing the, the annual temperature uh, per year or uh, incorporating battery degradation or engine decline over time. So these are ways that we are able to highlight and, and show uh, in a digital environment the impacts of uh, your decisions as part of the energy transition. So addressing range of anxiety, power, and life cycle costs, and then evaluating the resiliency of the fleet adoption in terms of 360 uh, approach uh, where we actually build up every component and give you an MPV against your business as usual against your RNG adoption scenario, your hydrogen or electric. And it really helps uh, fleets understand what they can actually do. So one of those uh, recent name, projects that we that actually- name, sorry, I'm gonna have to get you to wrap up really quickly here. It's five minutes for each panelist and I wanna make sure everybody has the time. So yeah. you can wrap up in less Perfect. than a minute, that'd be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, lessons learned from a recent pilot. So we worked with a, a very large pharmaceutical company to do uh, a pilot uh, from Ontario to Quebec. Uh, we did 60 runs. The average run length was about 600 kilometers each way. Average commercial load was 39,700 pounds. And what we uh, found were the four key lessons were, it's really important to have a refueling partnership early on because of the, the challenges of fueling hydrogen, of fueling natural gas, uh, establishing preventative cor corrective maintenance activities and scheduling them was another element that we needed to understand. Uh, tracking greenhouse gases was a great win for us. We were able to show that they were not only saving our fuel volumes, but GHG as well. And that uh, there was a lot of benefits around uh, driver training, giving them that upfront that really helped us in our pilot. So. Uh, 
that was our uh, pilot, which is now we're going to be seeing a ramp up of 17 CNG trucks running on one with this pilot. So this is a great success story for the pharmaceutical company as well as the private carrier. Uh, and then usually what we do is we always ask clients, where are they on their journey? Understanding, exploring, implementing, or executing, executing and monitoring. So thank you. That uh, concludes my presentation. All right. Thank, thanks, man. Uh, five minutes goes by pretty quickly. It's, it's hard to say hello in five minutes. <laughs> I get it. It's hard when you're going through the slides. So thank, thank you for the presentation. And uh, we will see Naeem in, uh, in 10 minutes or so when we get to the panel. Uh, next up, we have Adam Whitney from Cummins. Adam Whitney joined Cummins in 2000, holding a variety of roles within the truck engine business, including truck dealer manager, technical support manager, Canadian national account executive, and he currently leads the Canadian on highway sales support team. Adam is proud of the Cummins team, which provides fuel agnostic powertrain solutions to their customers, including diesel and natural gas, products today, as well as the new power solutions, including hydrogen and battery electric. Please welcome Adam. And Adam, I see your screen's up there, so you're, you're good to go. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate the opportunity to participate in this uh, important and timely discussion. I think uh, more and more vigor around um, these types of initiatives and alternative fuels and overall uh, carbon footprint reduction, so glad to be a part of it. I'm going to jump right in here. I, I think you know some of the prior panelists have talked about um, you know the endeavor for overall um, carbon reduction, and I think it is important to look at overall well-to-wheel emission. It's not just what comes out of the tailpipe. I think which was articulated well in the Ambridge video, um, and our view is it's really going to be a, a partnership of both um, innovation of energy sources. Uh, as well as power solutions. So I think the, the panelists here is a great example of that collaboration. Um, you know, as, as we endeavor to continue to innovate and scale up low carbon fuels of various varieties, um, you know, mature a hydrogen economy moving forward are gonna be fundamental. And it's a function of having that readily available at a cost effective manner and matching that with various power solutions. And we're seeing more and more entrants into the market. And I'll, I'll touch on some of the, um, products and how Cummins is looking at that market as well here. So when we think about commercial vehicle programs um, and our zero emission roadmap over time, uh, obviously there's there's a lot of options, right? And we really think it's not one solution will win out. Um, we think that there's the right solution for the right applications at the right time is really what is going to be important and what's going to play. Obviously, as time moves on, um, some may become more prevalent than others, but we really feel that all of the technology here on the screen will be viable and important to many customers. And what works for one customer may not be the right fit for the other customer. Um, obviously, there's barriers to all of these technologies. Um, you know, this slide's a few months old now, and in a few months, many of these barriers may be gone or well on their way to being um, uh, corrected. But again, it's going to be a time play. And, and I think, you know, as we get into um, more of the future on battery electric and fuel cell, um, but I think that's going to be a little bit at ways out. So we're going to talk a little bit more in this presentation about what's available today from an internal combustion engine standpoint of various fuel sources. Won't go through all of our products here, but again, this is what Cummins views as what's going to be important for the commercial vehicle segment and what we're aiming and endeavoring to offer to customers over a period of time. Um, what's in the middle of the screen here would be considered internal combustion engines. And then also we have a new power division, which is really focused on electrified powertrains as well as fuel cell technology. So I think it all will play and, and have a fit in the commercial vehicle space over time. From an internal combustion engine standpoint, and I'll focus on that here for the duration, just in the interest of time, um, really looking at a global fuel agnostic platform. Um, you'll see here three engines, three different fuel sources, and you'll notice that the engines all look the same and that's by design. Um, our vision for the future from an internal combustion engine standpoint is really to have as much of a common architecture as possible. Um, having that common architecture gives us scale, which then allows us to provide reliable and durable products cost effectively, right? So whether you're burning natural gas, diesel, hydrogen in the cylinder, the bottom end of the engine will be largely the same. Obviously the top end of the engine and fuel delivery system will have to differ uh, to accommodate that fuel source. But 
um, as agnostic a platform as possible is, is what our plan is moving forward. And that 15N will be the beginning of that, which I'll talk about here in a minute. So we really think we're excited about the 15 liter. We get questions all the time about it since we announced it uh, last uh, quarter. Um, again, really looking at that as being our, our kind of future platform, not only for natural gas, but for hydrogen and, and diesel moving forward as we get into future EPA and CARB regulations. Um, 15 liter natural gas specifically, um, really looking at that as being a 15 liter product in a 13 liter body, if you would. Um, It'll offer 500 horsepower 1850 torque, which I think has been um, much desired in the Canadian market with our loads and terrains that we have to cover in, in our geography and applications. Um, give improved fuel economy over what we have in today's 12 liter natural gas products. So I think that will be a benefit as well, but we'll fit in that envelope of where current 13 liter products fit. And from a weight standpoint, we'll actually be lighter than our 12 liter product is today by about 300 pounds. So some significant improvements there that we're really looking forward to delivering to the market, as well as another benefit um, of natural gas is its simple after treatment, right? I, I think, you know, we've gone through iterations over a decade of after treatment uh, in a diesel standpoint, and I think they're all in a very good place today, but natural gas has enjoyed uh, a much more simple endeavor of a, a passive three-way catalyst, very similar to what's in a passenger car, if you will, um, our natural gas engines um, give what's called stoichiometric combustion, um, which allows us a very simple passive after treatment, no DPF, no SCR, um, really no maintenance either. So um, saves weight and complexity and maintenance cost as well. And then just lastly, um, this slide says Cummins renewable natural gas engines, but I think we could just call it natural gas engine technology as a whole. Um, really excited because it's available today to help fleets with their carbon footprint reduction um, goals. Um, from an environmental standpoint, the first three bullets there are just when, when we think about burning regular natural gas, right? The 12 liter that's available, the nine liter, the 15 in the future on natural gas that's readily available today um, is 90% below e current EPA standards on both NOx and particulate matters. Um, and when we start talking about renewable natural gas, so whether that's from organic waste or animal byproducts, um, that then allows you to get into near or even sub-zero um, carbon emissions, which as Kelly alluded to, can generate um, carbon credits, which help the overall business as well from a um, carbon reduction standpoint. So lots to talk about in five minutes. I uh, look forward to the discussion a little bit later in the session. Thanks, Mike. All right. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. And um, last but not least, for our, our brief presentation before we go into the panel, we have David Hiller, President Hiller Truck Tech Incorporated. Uh, Hiller Truck Tech has made a niche in the truck space by pursuing the goal of helping clients reduce their carbon footprint on Canada's highways and roads. David is a leader in alternative to diesel fuel solutions. These solutions include offering propane, natural gas, and hybrid electric, and they have made Hiller a leader in converting trucks from diesel to natural gas. As an authorized conversion center, they have the proficiency to switch any truck uh, to either 100% natural gas or dual fuel alternatives. In addition to fuel system, con system conversions, David has introduced other products such as energy and maintenance procurement services, to help his clients improve their performance on and off the road. Uh, Dave, if you're there, you should be able to turn your camera on and, uh, and unmute yourself. I know I did make you a co-host um, and you were there. Let me go back and see if you're still here. I unmuted myself, does that work? Oh, perfect, there you go. Uh, you, you can turn your camera on as well if you want. Got the camera button there. There you go, perfect. Does that work? Okay, yep. wow, technology these days, eh? It just keeps uh, keeps getting better and better. Yes. So, See hey, guys, uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks for uh, putting us all together here. And uh, I don't have uh, slides to show. Uh, I'm just uh, here to share a few thoughts from the uh, technical side of things. And uh, it's been a, a busy, busy last little while here. So uh, busy putting trucks together. Um, 
Uh, Kelly uh, uh, in BC, we've talked a couple of times, and I see Fortis uh, helps out, Enbridge helps out here a little bit in the Ontario market, but uh, we don't have a lot of fleets buying uh, new trucks here uh, yet as far as natural gas goes. Uh, so we've been uh, very busy helping our customers uh, finding uh, good used equipment. So we've been bringing uh, used natural gas trucks up from the States um, just uh, to help. And then we go and uh, clean them up, paint them up, fix them up, whatever we've got to do to them. And that's the way we've been helping uh, our customers uh, this last little while uh, get into the natural gas program. Um, so that way we can get them uh, in a vehicle a little bit cheaper than what the new stuff is because we don't have a uh, subsidy money here yet uh, for new stuff. Uh, so we are a, a licensed conversion shop, but right now we're spending a lot of time, like I say, with the uh, with Paul Beater Westport engine. Uh, we've got some hybrid trucks. Uh, we mainly uh, start our program by leasing uh, or renting our trucks out uh, to our customers. It's a good way to answer a lot of questions when they finally get a truck in their hand. And uh, so that typically goes on for a, a couple months, and then uh, we transition the truck into uh, ownership for our customers at that point. As we all know, diesel prices are, are going through the roof right now. Um, but more than that, uh, the, the repairs of diesel trucks are, are just as difficult. We have a lot of customers now, uh, Freightliner, for example, you can't get computers. And so there's a lot of trucks that are uh, shut down uh, due to not being able to get parts. So that's uh, a difficult one. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of repairs on after treatment systems. So the fact that the Cummins natural gas engine uh, doesn't have SCR or DPF. Uh, when people start to rent these trucks or buy these trucks, they realize that's a big asset to be driving trucks that are uh, very clean for the environment and don't have uh, near as many sensors on. Um, so yes, yeah, so we, we are right on the ground level. Uh, we talk with customers every day, uh, even just this morning, another customer from the Windsor area who's been renting one of our trucks for just three weeks, ordered another uh, three more natural gas trucks. So now we've got to quickly go and get some of those ready. We're constantly uh, finding uh, different type of spec trucks uh, from the States and bringing them up. Uh, as we all know, uh, everybody's needs are a little bit different uh, from automatic to standard. Obviously pulling heavy is a little bit tricky. So yes, Adam, we're uh, patiently waiting for the X-15 and I don't know if it can come soon enough, but uh, hopefully uh, before too long. And uh, I'm sure that'll be a question at some point. Uh, is there any dates there yet? But um, making do with the uh, 12 liter, uh, guys are starting to realize they don't have to be the first ones on the top of the hill. Um, if it's saving them an extra, we got customers right now that they're saying $3,000 a month is what they're saving. Uh, so that's per truck per month in comparison to their diesel trucks that they're running. So that's a big number these days. Um, for a lot of the customers that are switching over, that's what makes them profitable when they switch over to a natural gas truck. Um, so we help with that process from a, from a technical side, uh, whether we got to build the truck or um, make some modifications. We actually built the, we didn't build, we, we took a Freightliner bunk truck and we uh, added some extra fuel storage uh, tanks to the truck in order to get it to go about 1600 kilometers in order to do a certain run for a customer. Uh, so we are an agility dealer. So we take agility tanks and we put side tanks on when a tank, when a truck only comes to the back of cab. And uh, so we take a bit of time to do that, but um, that way we can get some extra miles on the truck because fueling stations uh, here in Ontario, we have some, uh, we could use more, but right now we're focusing on getting more trucks on the road. So, so yeah, so from a technical side of things, I can answer questions uh, there, but uh, then we really help with the maintenance side. That's a big, uh, that's a tough one. And uh, I even alluded to that a little bit there. So we're just one of those shops that will really uh, renting out, we look after all the maintenance on the trucks. So that uh, takes anxiety off of the customer. And uh, so that helps in the fact that uh, we can kind of keep our hand on, on looking after the trucks. Um, so spark plug interval changes, um, oil changes, uh, sensors, check engines, like whatever the issue is, we can take care of that. So um, it's been busy there. So, so yeah, look forward to questions on a technical side of things. And uh, and if fleets are looking to switch from diesel to natural gas, uh, we're able to help uh, with that process. Okay. All right, thanks, Dave. You can leave your, uh, your camera and, and video on, and then I'm gonna ask uh, Kelly, Naeem, and, um, and uh, sorry, Kelly, Naeem, you're already on camera. Kelly, come off. Um, Naeem and Adam, if you all want to bring your, your video on, 
we will move into the panel discussion. There's everybody. Um, so we've got a few questions here. Kelly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start out with you uh, since you've had the longest break here of anybody since you, you began this all. Um, so how do you think the government could be more helpful in working with the uh, transportation industry? I know you touched on it a bit in, in BC, you know, there's quite a few credits for these, but as Dave touched on it, like there's very few credits for it in Ontario. So depending on where you are, it's, it's kind of a different landscape. So uh, in your view, how can the government help with this? Yeah, for sure. The one thing that's been rattling around in my head for the last little while um, the, you know, that I think could be looked at is, uh, right now, you know, the big thing that, that gets in my, <laughs> gets me all hot and bothered sort of thing is the carbon tax right now that, you know, whether it's federal provincial carbon tax and that's, that, uh, carbon tax is just, in my opinion, just going into, uh, general, um, coffers. Uh, I'd like to see something where if we're, I don't know, pick a number, but at the end of the year, we look down and say, you know, Cold Star as a company paid $50,000 to where or in carbon tax, I'd like to be able to um, purchase a CNG truck or an electric truck, knowing that um, once I submitted the receipt that I paid for that truck, that I can have that carbon tax back. Uh, um, so I, it's a bit, you know, I don't know if it's realistic or not, but from a business owner, um, if I knew that I was uh, paying the carbon tax, but if I was making the decision to uh, go greener, um, that I would automatically have that money come back to me in the form of a rebate. Um, and it would, you know, the government could easily put in, you know, a list of uh, equipment that is uh, pre-approved. So you submit it, boom, you know, whatever carbon you put in for that year uh, in form of carbon tax comes back. I think that's a very simple way. It's a win for the government. Not everybody's going to do it. So they, the government's still going to have the revenue that it's looking for in some cases, uh, or in most cases, but uh, they can turn around and, and say that it, that carbon tax is actually being used for what it should be for. Okay, appreciate it, Kelly. Uh, Naeem, next I'll come to you. Um, what challenges do you see fleets facing when they're implementing uh, alternative fuels, whatever those alternative fuels are. Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Mike, for the question. Well, I think, you know, when it comes to uh, challenges with alternative fuels, it's a systems-based approach. You cannot uh, look at something in isolation just as the vehicle or the fueling infrastructure or the facility. You have to look at it holistically and understand where the deficiencies and pros and cons are for the fuels in each of those segments and how it comes together uh, as you're planning. And I really recommend roadmaps and energy transition plans so you can actually understand that. And then from there, just add a pilot, you know, kick, kick some tires with one or two vehicles and understand what your uh, gaps are and where you need to improve. I don't I recommend everyone jump in with both feet, but uh, you know, go through the energy transition plan and then add a pilot, then go to your uh, ramp up of which technology works. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Neem. Uh, Adam, come to you next. Uh, what can you tell us about timing and availability uh, of the X-15 uh, to the market? I know you mentioned in your presentation that everybody wants to know when that's available. And, um, you know, it, it has been kind of announced publicly it's coming out. So I'm sure you're getting tons of questions as to when people might be able to get their hands on that. It's certainly a common question, Mike. I appreciate it. I, I wish I could say it was going to be tomorrow and we'd have one for everybody that wanted one. Um, but I mean, it, it's it's certainly coming uh, quickly and, and time will fly by. Um, where we're at today is, again, we've we've had the engine operating. We've got about 3,000 of them in operation in, in China currently uh, hauling payload. Um, North Americanizing it, obviously, there's some differences for the North American market and, and truck applications. Um, so doing that, we're looking at starting field tests, uh, Q4 of this year, you know, through early 2023 from a, you know, commercial production standpoint, uh, late 2023 is where we're targeting from an engine production standpoint. So lots of work to do in that year and a half will go by super, super fast. I think from a, you know, when can you get a truck with an X-15N is the next question, right? We can have the engine made and ready 
when can you get the truck? And that's going to be dependent on each OEM. Uh, looking forward to OEMs, um, you know, publicly expressing their adoption of the engine. Hopefully that comes here shortly. Um, I guess the call to action for anybody that's interested in one is to talk to your OEM of choice, express your interest in, and obviously their timeline of putting it in their chassis and making it ready, production ready in their chassis is, is up to them as well. So the more, uh, the more urgency we can put to them with the better through anybody on this call. Yeah, for sure. And I think we all know with the, the supply chain issues, getting your hand on any truck is a challenge, right? You know, like <laughs> you're looking at 18 months out a lot of times from a new truck over, no matter what it is. So it's it's definitely, we're all dealing with the challenges and the component shortages, the part shortages and almost anything. It seems. So you know, I appreciate that. Um, Dave, come back to you. And I know you run a shop as well as the conversions. Um, so what do you see, what's the difference in maintenance like on a CNG truck uh, compared to a diesel truck? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that uh, depends on the timeline you want to go and uh, put that over. So I like to do a five-year period because what we're seeing on the diesel trucks right now is uh, guys are having to get rid of their diesel trucks in five years. Uh, where a CNG truck, uh, you're going to keep that truck for 15 years. Uh, yeah, you're going to rebuild the engine, um, I guess, at some point, let's say year eight, year 10, year seven, whatever that is. But uh, you have the ability to keep it to, for a 10, 15 year period because you don't have the expensive emission systems to, uh, to have to get rid of that truck. So in a five year period, um, obviously, I haven't been running the trucks. Uh, Kelly's been running trucks longer than that. But uh, I'll, have, I'll be bold and say on a five year period, we uh, uh, are going to see a uh, lower costs maintenance wise, uh, worst case scenario, we would be very similar to that of a diesel um, because of the fact that you have to uh, get rid of the diesel truck after five years. I don't know too many customers right now that are trying to keep the 2015 trucks and 2016 diesel trucks, right? Uh, here we're refurbishing 2015 and 16 natural gas and putting back out there again. So, so costs have got to be less. Uh, obviously, uh, urea prices have gone way up. So you have a savings on urea, obviously fuel savings is a big one, um, but maintenance costs, uh, we're saying that uh, that's gonna be even uh, cheaper as well. We're already rebuilding some engines right now and just to rebuild an engine, uh, if you have to do that on a natural gas truck, it's cheaper than a diesel truck, right? So diesel trucks, engines are, yeah, 1.2 and uh, you're not getting a 2 million kilometers anymore on a diesel engine uh, like we used to be due to all the, the regen and the temperatures. So. I think we're at par with uh, with diesel, if not a little bit better. Right. Okay, appreciate that. Um, Adam, I'm going to jump back to you. Um, what advice would you give to fleets interested in adopting the use of alternative fuels? Uh, what things should they be thinking about? Uh, no, we, we, we talked to lots of fleets about it over, over many years. And I think Naeem touched on, I think he had a great slide that kind of articulated some of the things that they think through with their customers and Sounds like they have a pretty good model. I, I think guidance I would give is, is seek guidance from industry experts and early adopters of whatever technology you're looking at, whether it's natural gas, um, electrification, obviously we're at the earlier stages of that, but um, talk to folks that have done it and try to understand what the right fit is for you. Because what works for one customer, like I said earlier, may not work for you based on your application, your duty cycle, um, we all have different goals in our businesses too, right? Some are gonna do it from a pure cost perspective. Others may do it from a, a carbon footprint perspective and, and part of their overall attainment strategy. So, um, you know, what makes sense for your business may not make sense for somebody else's. Um, and then I think thinking through things about the fuel that you're choosing as well, is the infrastructure in the right place for you? Does it fit your application, your routes, how you're gonna operate your business? Are you going to have to modify your business based on that? You, you asked a, a good question about maintenance. Understand that and compare your current, you know, power source and fuel source, probably diesel. How does that look compared to say natural gas? Because there are differences on intervals. Now we have spark plugs. Um, can you bring it in? Where can you get it worked on? So things that can all be overcome and, and there's all kinds of um, solutions at the ready, but I think understanding that and going into any venture eyes fully wide open is certainly key. And I think talking to folks that have done it is probably the best first step. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, not every, you know, there's different uh, different forms of alternative fuels that are going to work better for one fleet than another, depending on the application. So, yeah. uh, Dave, I'll flip back to you. Uh, what's fuel consumption like 
uh, compared to diesel. And I think when most people ask these, this question, they're looking at two things. What, what's the equivalent for, for distance um, for tank size and, and the cost? So um, what's the consumption like compared to diesel from, from your side, Dave? Yeah, so that's definitely, I think, the hard part. That's what makes us uh, extremely busy getting a truck ready right now is, is having the ability to go the distance that is required by the customer. Um, fuel mileage, uh, we are seeing uh, on 15 to 20% uh, more fuel that we're burning with the natural gas trucks. Um, just the BTU isn't there like on diesel. So, of course, just like a Duramax pickup truck uh, with a diesel. Uh, engine and is going to get better fuel economy than that same truck with the natural uh, sort of gasoline engine. So a diesel truck does get better fuel economy. Um, but so now the fact that we are 20% more fuel, you, that range anxiety is the big one, I think, for our customers. Uh, so that's where we do spend quite a bit of time making sure we have enough fuel uh, on board for the routes they're doing. Uh, but it's it's doable. I mean, uh, we're Finding trucks with longer wheelbases is a little bit more beneficial. Um, so with a longer wheelbase, we can put a back of cab on and then get a good side mount tank on as well. So if we can do a back of cab and a side mount tank, uh, we can get some good distance uh, out of the trucks then. And uh, that's where they then really start to save big dollars there because uh, we all know that the, the, the guys putting the big miles on or the guys bringing the most fuel or the guys putting the most miles on wanna have that uh, range anxiety uh, looked after with uh, more tank packages on, right? You said the consumption was 20%. Right now, what's basically the difference in cost? You're burning 20% more fuel, but how much cheaper is the natural gas in comparison to the diesel rate? Oh yeah, we're, we're half price uh, on our diesel uh, from diesel rate. So if you're half price, most guys right now are spending $10,000 a month on their diesel. Uh, so now they're spending $5,000 a month. Okay, maybe 5,500 to $6,000 a month on natural gas because they are burning a little bit more. So they're still, right? Okay. Big savings there because the, the big difference now that the guys running locally are maybe only burning six thousand dollars a month on their local trucks, but now doing that with the natural gas, you're four thousand. There's still two thousand dollars in savings just in fuel alone. Um, never mind some of the other things we talked about too. So significant so, changes right now when you have the spread of fuel costs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, especially where we are right now with diesel. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, uh, Kelly. We'll flip back to you again. What is the future look like for Cold Star's CNG program for your fleet? Yeah, um, you know, I think we're very committed to that um, just on the fuel price there. Um, or I looked at it the other day. Uh, we pay 75 cents a diesel gallon uh, or a liter equivalent, sorry. Um, so, you know, if, if diesel, you know, before this price increase, uh, recently it was $1.30, we're paying 75 cents and it stays that way for the year. Um, uh, we, it's, uh, Fortis sets a price for us on January 1st. So it helps us budget uh, and stuff like that. So we're, we easily save 30%. Future for us um, is certainly um, CNG. Um, however, one of the challenges that we're having like everybody else is we can't buy any trucks right now. I need five uh, class eight tractors. Uh, if I could get them tomorrow, I would. Um, so, um, I, I don't see us buying any diesel trucks, but we're looking at every technology, uh, and whoever can provide us a truck so we can look after our customers is probably the first one. Um, just you know, on a side note, uh, we have purchased our very first all electric reefer five ton, uh, really excited about that through Lion Electric out of Montreal. Uh, and that is uh, being shipped. Uh, it's over getting the cargo box put on right now. And we'll have a Volta Air electric reefer put on in Vancouver um, by the end of April. And that truck will be in service by mid-May um, for our local P&D work. So it'll be the very first electric uh, refrigerated truck ever produced in, in North America, from my understanding. So... But uh, to the, to you know some of the other <clears throat> comments of you know one solution is not going to be the answer. I, I truly believe that we're not going 100% electric. We're not you know we're looking at what is the right application and the right equipment for the right application. So city P and D work where the truck does 150 to 200 kilometers in a in a shift. Uh, this makes sense. Our other stuff will be CNG. So yeah. For sure. All 
Great. I appreciate it. We have two questions from the audience. Just before I get to them, Naeem, I've got one more I'm going to, uh, going to throw at you, and then we'll get to the two audience questions. So uh, what role does natural gas RNG have in the future of fleets? So kind of building off a little bit of, of what Kelly just discussed, I guess. Yeah, you know, uh, like others have said on the panel, uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. I think CNG gives you a lot of understanding of uh, uh, of, uh, of the technology that can be applied to hydrogen, uh, as well as uh, CNG to RNG is a very clean path to uh, net zero uh, emissions that uh, it's really should be looking at. And, you know, I think the, the future uh, RNG will have a, a big play as government incentives do start kicking up and carbon tax increases across coast to coast, those incentives will become uh, very powerful in the decision making process. And Kelly is an early adopter of those. And we just saw some amazing numbers from his fleet when it comes to carbon tax credits. For sure. And we, we always see people talk about alternative fuels a little more too when diesel prices spike and go through, go through the roof, which they definitely are right now. Uh, so two questions from the audience. Um, first one for, for Kelly. Uh, CNG range, you mentioned, of 400 kilometers. Uh, they want to know, and you're lucky enough to be in the warmest spot in Canada, but it still does get, get cold occasionally. Now, they want to know how does this range suffer in, in cold weather? Uh, does the performance suffer any? And if the range does suffer in the, in the colder weather, how much did that range go down? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, but yes, I live in Victoria and our trucks work in Victoria. So, I mean, we get below zero, maybe two or three days a year. So, <laughs> and I like to brag about that all the time. So <laughs> I, I've lived all across Canada and, uh, and we're very spoiled out here. So um, we haven't noticed uh, any difference, but like I say, I haven't really tracked it because uh, we're probably not the right guys uh, to do that. Um, what I can say is with the two 45 DG tanks on there, um, uh, we've never had range anxiety. We, um, if we can, uh, uh, I think the longest route we do is 350 kilometers. And the other part that, that's key to note in the refueling is that uh, the fueling stations that we've um, worked with or partnered with Fortis to build are all fast fill stations. So we fuel both tanks in less than 15 minutes. Um, and so it's actually faster than fueling diesel and cleaner. Our guys aren't all covered and stuff. So as long as you have the fuel stations uh, strategically located uh, like we do, um, we don't even, we don't worry about it at all. So hopefully that answers your question. You have to ask somebody out east uh, about the cold thing. So yeah, sure. All right. Um, next question. Um, I think we've kind of covered this. And if anybody has anything different to add, they they can. But uh, the question they threw out was if CNG is a better option, why is, in their opinion, only electric vehicles being profoundly promoted? Um, I, I I don't necessarily think it's. It's a better option. I know a couple of you have said it. What what I've always said is if is if we're ever truly going to transition to a lower carbon footprint, we have to look at all the options because they're all going to have their own niche and their own market to kind of play. If we think diesel is going to be 100% gone in the next 30 or 40 years, that's not realistic either. But we have to remove a segment from diesel. You're going to need a segment on electric. You're going to need a segment on on gas. You may need a segment on hydrogen. Like the different technologies work differently and better depending on the application that that you need as, as, as far as I'm concerned. And I know, I think a couple of you has mentioned that already. So anything different to add from, from what I've said there, guys? I, I can certainly speak up. I, I've been frustrated with this for eight years. I don't understand why the adoption rate has been so slow. Um, I think, you know, the trucks are expensive and we need to figure out ways to get the price down. Um, and if the governments uh, and, and organizations aren't going to have the incentives in place, um, then that's a barrier. But I think a CNG truck, especially once that 15 liter comes out um, with an RNG fuel, I think is, is the cleanest technology that we've got going, uh, you know, and at least, you know, if we can, putting in the infrastructure isn't that big of a deal. There's natural gas all across the country. It's just a matter of tapping into it. 
the the problem is that the fuel companies need the volume. So it's a chicken and the egg thing. It drives me crazy every day. We save 30% in operating costs on these trucks. Our drivers love them. The customers love them. Um, and then we sell our carbon credits on top of it. it for me, it's a, an absolute no brainer. The biggest hurdle, in my opinion, is the cost of the truck. We got to get that cost down. And yeah, it's co cost, weight um, for weight sensitive activities, like you said, the infrastructure, whether it's natural gas or electricity, we, we yeah. got to have more charging and filling stations. Yeah. But one more question came in. I want to get to it because we're right at 12 o'clock. So um, we'll go a minute over because this was probably an easy one. Um, Cummins engine warranty for the new engine. Do you, do you have any info on that, uh, Adam? That's a pretty specific question. Do you know what the warranty is gonna be like for the new natural gas Cummins engine? I, I don't yet, yeah, no, I apologize. Um, I'm sure it'll be in line with what's, you know, pretty standard across our 15, 12 diesels and 12 natural gas. So um, okay. you know, a wide variety of extended coverage options. So it should all be fairly in line, but we'll make sure that's widely available. Okay, appreciate it. Um, guys, uh, thanks for your time. Lots of, lots of valuable, uh, lots of valuable insight and information there. I appreciate you guys taking times out of your busy schedule to, to be here with us today. Um, I want to again, thank Enbridge and, and West Hill, uh, for their sponsorship, for making this, uh, this possible for everybody free to attend. And I want to thank everybody for attending today. So everybody have a good day, stay safe. And, uh, thanks a lot. We'll see you again soon. Take care. Take care. Thank you.